We are proud that the Republic of Angola is a member of the Gas Exporting Countries Forum, the GECF, an intergovernmental organization comprising 20 countries that collectively represent around 70% of global gas reserves and 40% of gas exports. Excellencies, the recent global health and economic crisis, coupled with rising geopolitical tensions, have underscored energy's critical role as the lifeblood of modern economies driving sustainable development. These challenges have pushed energy security to the top of policy agendas, highlighting the need to balance security, affordability, and sustainability. This balancing act is complex for all nations, but especially for Africa. Looking ahead, the challenge intensifies as global energy demand grows. According to the latest GECF global gas outlook, global primary energy consumption is projected to increase by 20% by 2050, driven by a global population growth of 1.7 billion, primarily in developing countries, and the doubling of the global economy size. Meeting diverse energy demands while protecting the environment highlights the need for a nationally determined approach. There is no single universal solution. Achieving sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement objectives requires integrating a variety of energy sources and technologies tailored to each country's specific circumstances, capabilities, and priorities. Let in this intricate tapestry of energy pathways, one prominent threat stands out, natural gas. Available, clean, flexible, versatile, natural gas facilitates orderly, equitable, and cost-effective energy transitions that leave no one behind. Switching from wood to LPG for cooking and heating can significantly lower indoor pollution, which the World Health Organization attributes to 3.2 million deaths per annum globally. This shift not only improves health, but also helps preserve forests, a vital carbon sink, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Natural gas enhances urban air quality, supports power grids reliant on intermittent renewables, and plays a vital role in global food security, being the primary component in fertilizer production. The GECF projects natural gas demand to increase by 36% by 2050, and its share will rise from 23% today to 26% in 2050. It is the fastest growing energy after renewables. GECF member countries are actively working to enhance the sustainability of natural gas by improving energy efficiency, reducing gas flaring and methane emissions, scaling up carbon capture and utilization and storage, and advancing the development of the blue hydrogen economy. Excellencies, in Africa, blessed with a young demographic and abundant natural resources, yet plagued by energy poverty, socioeconomic development is an overriding priority. With 40% of the continent's population without access to reliable electricity, the energy needs are struggling. Energy demand is projected to more than double by 2050 driven by the a population increase of nearly 1 billion, from 1.5 billion today to 2.5 in 2050, by rapid urbanization and by tripling of GDP. Notably, natural gas has seen a remarkable growth in Africa's energy mix, rising from 9% in 2000 to 16% in 2022, with projections suggesting a steady increase to 21% by 2050. Africa's natural gas resources are huge and the continent remains underexplored. However, converting gas resources into proven reserves and reliable supply requires substantial investments in exploration, development, infrastructure, and human capacity building. 
The notion that natural gas investment is incongruent with climate change mitigation is misguided. African nations bearing no historical responsibility for climate change and contributing only a mere 3% to global greenhouse gas emissions should not be penalized for using their natural resources to lift their people out of poverty. In the Algeria's declaration of the 7th GECF summit held in Algeria in March of this year, the heads of state and government expressed their strong support for African countries in their efforts to tackle energy poverty, improve energy access, and foster sustainable, equitable, and inclusive socioeconomic development while protecting the environment. We call on financial institutions, particularly the African Development Bank, to lead in advancing natural gas development in Africa. The socioeconomic upliftment of the continent is not only a right, but a priority. At GECF, we will continue championing this cause at the upcoming COP29 in Baku, and I invite everyone to visit our pavilion there, and I wish you a successful conference. Thank you very much. Whenever you have an opportunity to moderate a ministerial panel, you start by negotiating what you would do. And that tells you how it goes. But with us starting, we would like to give the first opening remarks from His Excellency, the Minister from the DRC, to open these discussions. Minister. Uh, so it's good to be here in Angola, where Angola is a pioneer, and uh, Angola is an uh, old uh, sister in what has to do with the hydrocarbonate uh, uh, sector. And uh, so we are here in a modest way to uh, learn and have uh, some dialogues. And uh, we know that in these types of conference, the B2Bs are much more important, and uh, we are uh, in two years, we have launched ourselves in the uh, oil and gas sector, in the oil and gas sector uh, that uh, we promoted. And, uh, and unfortunately, on the 27 uh, blocks, we did not have any success. And uh, we are going to uh, stop uh, with uh, exploration, and it will be on the 10th of October. Uh, that's when we are going to finish with the first series. Uh, we are going to. St uh, we have block one and two, which are the two, uh, which are the most productive blocks, and. Um, we are going to collect the seismic status and also the transmission of 3D. And uh, at the end, uh, we are going to optimize the transportation costs, negotiating with Ghana so that we can have access to, to the amendment. And uh, we are also going to make a public procurement of the two uh, blocks, and probably with uh, block three, which is productive, but it was amputated. And uh, we are also going to protect it. We are also here to uh, search for partners who can help us out. And uh, why not think uh, as Angola so that Angola can get this database in terms of blocks that uh, the watch the country um, possesses. And that is going to allow us to still uh, continue to run with whatever, with the work that is also happening in uh, uh, neighboring countries. I'm also going to talk about the Brazil. Today we uh, signed some uh, treats, which were the treats of governance, uh, which is also the production or exploration uh, partnership. And uh, we are making it more operational on the uh, interesting uh, 
common interesting zone. Uh, we're just waiting for the ratification of the two countries. And uh, this is going to be uh, later after the approval of the two head of states. Uh, the uh, Chevron will be the technical um, the technical leader, and they're going to give us the calendar of uh, their production. And before I finish, I'm going to, uh, I would like to uh, thank my, my, uh, my with warmth, uh, Thanksgiving to uh, my brother Diamantino, and uh, we are going to have some good contacts uh, during these two days, and uh, so that we can see if uh, RDC can have uh, 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 if we can all have some productive discussions and also take advantage of the experiences of Angola. Thank you so much. Uh, Jose Masan, Minister of State for Economic Cooperation in Ang of Angola. His Excellency Diamantino Asvedas, Minister of Mineral Resources, Petroleum and Gas of Angola. All other excellencies mm -hmm. and ministers that are present here today from Angola and other uh, countries, captain of industries, all protocol observed, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> it's an honor to speak to you at this prestigious event where we have gathered to discuss the future of an industry that plays a vital role of, uh, in our economies. I would like to extend my profound gratitude to His Excellency, Engineer Diamantino Minister, and all the organizers for a well-organized conference and the gracious host, um, the Republic of Angola. I found the theme of the fifth annual oil and gas conference an exhibition more fitting, driving exploration and development towards increased production in Angola. And this resonates so well with the current petroleum activities in Namibia as a frontier in the oil and gas. Angola has been a significant player in the oil and gas industry and the government along with the different stakeholders has been actively engaged in uh, exploration to boost production for over six decades, cutting across the value chain of oil production. As we all know, the oil and gas sector continues to be the mainstay of energy supply, and it has fueled industrial growth and contributed significantly to economic development worldwide. Your Excellencies, allow me to allude to the ever-flourishing relationship between Angola and Namibia, which has grown from the liberation struggle assistance and comradeship to thriving bilateral cooperation, touching on several sectors, which amongst others include energy, water, logistics, and security, and defense. The notion of working together towards achieving common objectives between Angola and Namibia is being assured by the fact that Angola and Namibia are both members of the regional, continental, and international bodies. Your Excellencies, it's worth mentioning that despite the long-standing relationship, our countries continue to fortify our bilateral relations by signing and ratifying several instruments and agreements. The cooperation between Angola and Namibia in the oil and gas sector continue to grow stronger, exemplifying by the memorandum of understanding between Namibia, Ministry of Mines and Energy, and Angola's National Oil, Gas, and Biofuel Agency, ANPG. This partnership focuses on strengthening regulatory compliance, enhancing governance in the oil and gas industry. I'm therefore pleased to report that the implementation of this MOU is progressing well with several joint projects already underway between the Petroleum uh, Affairs Department and or Directorate 
in the ANPG. The year 2022, His Excellency Diamantino visited Namibia with his delegation, and that has culminated in signing two memorandum of understanding and uh, between the two governments, between the Minister of Mines and Energy of Namibia and the Ministry of Mineral Resources, Petroleum and Gas of Angola. These agreements focus on the exchange program related to policies, laws, training, development, and research, and also for future developments. Secondly, it also culminated in a tripartite agreement between NAMCOR, our oil corporation company, NAMPORT for our port facility, and Sonangol. This strategic partnership demonstrated the power for regional collaboration and capacity building and acknowledging transfer within the knowledge transfer within the oil and gas sector. A significant achievement of this MOU is a successful training of 12 Namibians at the Sonil Logistic Base in Angola. The currently ongoing TSP training program will equip Namibians with essential technical skills and expertise. And this initiative foster close ties between our nations. Namibia is an emerging player in the oil and gas, has a golden opportunity to leverage and learn from the robust expertise and successes of Angola in the oil and gas industry. Our countries need to work together in developing frameworks and bilateral collaborations. These, they are still more in Namibia to be discovered when it comes to investment, both in the Orange Basin offshore, Wolfish Bay, Ludret, and also in the Namibia Basin. There are tremendous opportunities that are mostly unexplored. Therefore, we are currently looking for investment in these basins. We are also finalizing our local content framework that will create an in-country value across the entire Namibia economy. The sector of oil and gas has been continually tested by different factors currently, uh, geopolitics, market uncertainty, and that calls for us to adapt and remain agile and be innovative. Namibia exemplifies the efforts in both oil and gas and mining sector. We continue to collaborate with investors and industry stakeholders to foster further improvements. Our efforts to create an enabling environment for investors played a significant role in driving the drilling campaigns by Shell, Total Energies, Gulp, and Qatar Energy. The investment these companies are making in Namibia will play a central role in generating government revenue, building roads, bridges, and dams, creating jobs, and improving standards of living for every Namibian in line with the vision of our government. However, we must not compromise our own needs and priorities in attracting investment. African nations must always seek investment that are mutually beneficial. This can be achieved through balanced and pragmatic local content policies that offer employment, business opportunities, capacity building, and technology and knowledge transfer. Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, looking forward, I'm quite adamant that the oil and gas sector will continue to be a key player in the global energy arena. If we continue to look towards innovation, the sector will continue to grow in leaps and bounds and remains vibrant for generations to come. Therefore, in conclusion, 
I would like to again show my gratitude to the organizers as well as everyone who have contributed to this amazing conference. Together we can shape the future for the oil and gas sector. I thank you. Dr. Omar Farouk, opening the remarks before I ask you a question about money. Thank you very much, um, NJ. I, I don't have opening remarks, but I had planned to deliver a keynote. So let me quickly summarize mm -hmm. what I wanted to say, because I'm not sure you're going to ask me those questions here. First, I want to commend mm -hmm. Angola for the theme of this conference, driving exploration and development. It's very well chosen. The sub-theme towards increased production in Angola could as well have been titled towards increased production in Africa. For the upstream challenges that Angola faces today are not different from what most African oil and gas producing countries face. I see in the theme of this conference, the emerging Africa, the Africa that is not swayed by external pressure or influences to do the biddings of others. Africa that critically looks at issues to determine what is in its best interest. Africa that looks beyond the immediate. For too long, we have succumbed to the dictates of others. In the name of climate change, we have been told to end fossil fuel use. We have been told that if we take that advice, we will be supported with billions of dollars to migrate from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Some of us have taken the bait and are looking forward to getting climate funds. But you, can, you can't eat your cake and have it. <clears throat> to get climate funds, you have to abandon what you have, namely fossil fuels. In the past, many African countries will be trooping to get that fund, but today, we are wiser, and that is seen in the resolve of Angola to drive exploration and production. I call on all African and non-African oil and gas endowed countries to give their upstream sector the priority it deserves. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, if there is any certainty about the push for energy transition, it is that the United Nations quest for eradication of energy poverty by the year 2020, uh, 2030 will be a mirage, especially if the world continues to deceive itself into believing that that goal can be achieved without oil and gas. The sad thing today is that investments in the upstream sector has dwindled either because of punitive policies introduced by the powerful nations who are principally responsible for the mess called climate change or because of overhyped concerns about climate change. And the results of these are already beginning to be felt and will get worse. If you think that energy prices are high in Africa today, wait for 2030, when the world shall need more energy but that energy shall not be available because the world failed to make the required investments in oil and gas at the right time. Unfortunately, Africans are going to be the worst victims of these high energy prices, even when we produce energy. This is because our currencies are daily depreciating and so our daily, our daily losing purchasing power and they have been made to believe that the priority is to earn dollars from their energy, not to energize their national economies. This is why I commend the organizers of this conference in looking beyond the present. The message to all who have money to invest is to be smart enough to make that investment in the upstream sector today, as the time will come soon when energy prices will hit the roof. Invest in Africa's oil and gas, and you'll be happy you did. I thank you very much. Minister Diamantino, 
I would start the first question with you, and I'll be asking you to tell us what you did not say in your speech. I haven't asked the question. Please. Can you please update us with a lot of deals that are going to be signed? These type of questions are good questions because I usually do not answer uh, those questions. <laughs> but uh, I take this opportunity to convey my message instead of just answering what you want to hear from me. But we will have opportunity in other panels uh, to lessen on all that we are doing. Much was said by the president already, uh, by the keynote speakers, by myself as well. But I would like to take this opportunity to speak on what we are doing, on what we can do with the ministers in attendance. Uh, Congo, Namibia, we are also had with us the Minister of Ivy Coast, and we also have with us Apple, Apple, and his Secretary General, Apple, Secretary General of Apple. Our brother from RDC has already explained that we have an important project, which is a common interest zone, that finally, after all these years, it seems like uh, as say the Brazilians, finally, uh, with the signing of the two documents that will be ratified by the parliament, and then we go to the most important activity, which is to produce oil. I believe that this is a case study uh, so that we can lecture at our universities and to be as an experience as the case of Yanzi, a project that we have with the Ada Congo. But basically, the importance of this project with RDC, taking into account that we are brother countries, don't forget that before the territory of Angola were several kingdoms, among them the kingdom of Congo that extended uh, to the northern part of Angola, by Congo, by Gabon, also capital was Angola, the city of Banza Congo, which is the capital of the Zairo province. We have a common border. We have to foster those projects. We have an opportunity, and now, finally, we are going to execute this project, which is important, and also we have other uh, important items, which is the supply of, of uh, gas to RDC, which we are already doing, but we want to improve this relation so that we can, in a more organized way, also continue improving this activity uh, of supplying oil derivatives to, to RDC will ask the minister to look into this question, but what do I mean to that? Sometimes we in Africa, as say, as say the deputy minister of Namibia, we have the MOU signs, but when it comes for the execution, we have difficulties when executing. But the moment now is less political issues, but this is a business moment because it was said here already, we have to start being more independent. Economic relations between African countries have to come at the top with Namibia uh, due to our relation. Uh, the deputy minister specified here a lot. There is a great opportunity for us to make businesses. This is what we want to do and I'm going to propose here publicly to my sister from Namibia. We want to go to Namibia soon and take all our technical potential to Angola and show Namibia what we know how to do, what we can do, all our know-how, all our capacity.
technical capacity and training capacity, the deputy minister knows very well, but we want to go there and we are making this open proposal. Take our main companies and let Namibia know what we can do from what they can get from their brother country of Angola. Not just rely on MOUs. Let us be practical. With regard to Apple, I don't know where I miss out something, the General Secretary spoke on the African Bank for Energy. If he did not mention that, and I would like to make a question on the African Bank on Energy, there has to be initiatives. Angola has been very active so that we, this initiative goes to, into practice, the establishment of the African Bank on Energy so that we have an African instrument that might support our initiatives. The, ministry, the Minister of Ivory Coast has already left. He had some other duties to attend to. But yesterday, the minister visited the Sonil Base and the message that I conveyed to the minister after I asked what, what was his impression, I said, Minister, let's together do something similar at Ivy Coast to say that Angola has the equipment at Ivy Coast in downstream, but we have this opportunity, Ivy Coast, is going now into the oil activity, we should use the experiences that we have. We have with us Minister Gabriel, I call him Minister even though he does not want to, but also, I don't know whether he'll be at another panel, to convey what he's promoting, what he's trying to implement right now, and that, that is also a good initiative as well. I don't know what, whether this was the expectation. I believe that for this panel, those reflections, uh, the ones that I would like to bring, not forgetting that we have a lot of projects, and as said shortly, uh, the president in 2017, many of our partners wanted to leave our country. Today, we see uh, the interest has increased, even though we have living through difficult, difficult moments in the oil sector. Uh, our challenge remains mainly drilling. That's our main challenge. Mr. Minister Sakombi. You have done in question um, the party, the RDC. With that, senior Nako, come to the party. If you sign in a MOU, as was said, that would start an exploration with Angola and the Chevron Company, what are the, oppor the opportunities that Congo has? that we can collaborate with those, with the Angolan companies and also the international companies. And if, it, if they are in the same initiative or in the same profession, where Angola will be able to be in, make investment in Congo, Thank you for your question. Uh, we need a strategic partnership between the big national companies, Sonango and Sana Hydroke, be the and also even the oil logistic. I will have a meeting, a B2 meeting in, I believe, Friday on the 4th, where we are going to be looking into several issues, deepening ZIC, which is the biggest contract that RDC uh, has as far as exploration is concerned. I would like here to remind that the last research were from 1995. It's true that recently 
the company Perenklu told us when the new well, which is called Yorke, that uh, we were uh, we were hoping for to get this news to be able to know what is the size of this well and what is the exact timeline to its production. And truth be said, with regard to Sona Drop, we'll be able to purchase products uh, from Sonango, and also because we share a common border, but uh, the zone of supply, we have 50%, and a terrible loss for both countries as far as revenue is concerned, and also I'm sure that we'll be able to find solutions that uh, might depend that by the construction of the pipelines uh, that we have with Angola, and also with some potential investors in the hall that we want to come and invest in this sector in terms of logistic, maybe up to five years. So I'm here with my delegation open. I believe that uh, we are, uh, this is a word what I would like to say for today, and my thank you to all. Thank you, Minister. You are, Namibia has basically become the drill baby drill capital of Africa with a lot of discoveries around your orange basin. But you will also have to deal with a lot of collaboration, especially with deep water, as the minister just mentioned and as you also mentioned in your speech. How, what are you doing to fast track that collaboration and utilization of skills, but also share a lot of, sh share a lot of services with the oil companies that some of them that are operating in Namibia are also operating in Angola. Are you fast tracking those discussions and where do we stand? Thank you very much for the question that um, is focusing more on uh, the collaboration that we are uh, actually um, busy uh, doing. And uh, what is it that we are doing as Namibia? We are the frontiers, as I have uh, explained in my speech, uh, oil and gas uh, industry is quite a new sector for us as uh, Namibia. But uh, related now to the question, we are into collaborating, mm -hmm. as um, uh, was alluded to. Mm -hmm. But what I can say, I would want to start with uh, our learning exercise. Uh, when you have something new, you would want really to get an understanding of uh, that something new that you just had uh, dis have discovered. Uh, since the, the, the discovery uh, that is made um, mainly in the Orange Basin by the companies, as I have alluded to earlier in my speech, we have decided and we have embarked upon a learning exercise, learning from others that have come before us, learning from those that have uh, uh, become perhaps, I can say, experts in the industry, and also learning from other frontiers, just to those that um, have recently um, uh, discovered uh, before us. Uh, and when we are taking up this learning exercise, we are looking at some of the best practices that has happened. We have learned as a, um, uh, a new uh, country that have discovered 
We have learned about the terms of oil can be a blessing, oil can be a curse. So we would want to understand as to what is it that makes oil to be a blessing and what is that that makes oil to be a curse. So from those, um, uh, those terms associated now with the best practices and also associated with uh, perhaps the worst case scenarios, we are open for learning. And with that, we have uh, made um, uh, various visits. Of course, we have uh, visited Angola uh, because we believe we do not really need to go far if uh, Angola is just here nearby. Uh, on my way to fly here, I had just to, to fly from Onjiva, and Onjiva is in Angola, and is about uh, uh, 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers from Namibia. Therefore, uh, it's just around the corner where we need to land. So, um, as I have alluded to earlier, the, the minister, Diamantino, visited Namibia, and uh, that was also followed by my various visits by my minister. Myself, I also came here with a delegation and we visited um, uh, so many companies and so many institutions. I remember we visited Sonangol, um, the, the Secretary of State, uh, um, um, uh, Barroso, uh, took me through uh, to, to various institutions and to various companies. We visited Sonil, we visited Sonangol, we visited Sonamet, we went to Pinel, we also went to visit Lobito and many, many others. And that was a learning exercise from uh, our, our, our side. Uh, and from all these exchange visits that we had, emanated now the Memorandum of Understanding. Of course, the minister is uh, encouraging that the, 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 the Memorandum of Understanding has to be implemented. But minister, I want to, uh, to, to, to just indicate to you that we have started implementing some of our Memorandum of Understanding with uh, you as uh, Angola, and uh, we continue to do that and on that note, I think we will not go uh, backward. We will continue to, 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 to implement what we have agreed upon. And um, we have also visited countries like uh, Guyana, uh, visited like uh, Norway, countries that are known to be doing well. We visited the US, we visited Nigeria, my minister also went to Equatorial Guinea. Uh, Sir Gabriel, you are just here. You invited us and we came. And uh, this is all for us to, 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 to learn. But as I have explained before, we still have uh, many exploration opportunities in Namibia, um, in our basins like what I said in Wolfish, in Luderet Basin, in Namib, in Orange Basin, which is uh, currently being explored. And uh, we need investors to come to, to Namibia. We are open for business, and uh, we have created uh, a platform as government, uh, a conducive environment for business to, to take place. I thank you. Financing has become a really big issue with the Africa upstream sector. There are those that believe that financing Africa oil and gas should not be at a priority. A lot of Western financial institutions, because of their EHG, they would not put financing into oil and gas. And the exclusion rule, sometimes which permits Europe to define natural gas as green and still be able to get funding. But most of the explorers here are going through a very difficult time with getting funding for 
um, oil and gas projects. You have worked with the African Bank on the Africa Energy Bank. Without sounding like a politician, can you tell us the state of the bank, what is going to happen, and where we are right now? I had a meeting with the president of Africa Exim Bank in Abidjan. And immediately after the meeting, I was convinced that this guy means business and he shares our vision for the oil and gas industry. Right there, I picked the phone and I called His Excellency. He was then the president of APO. And I said, Excellency, I need to come and see you. He said, take the next available flight. I came to Luanda. And I said, this is a conversation I've had with Afri Exim Bank. And I think going alone as Apple, we can't make it. But we need a strong partner to work on this. And he said, it makes a lot of sense. I said, what do we do? He said, go back to him, start negotiation. And I said, but Excellency, you need to take this to the ministerial council. He said, I've given you anticipatory approval. Go and do what needs to be done. Let's leave the ministerial council with me. And that is how, by the time we went to the ministerial council, the president had succeeded in getting his people behind him. We came here and we signed the MOU for the establishment of the Africa Energy Bank with Africa Exim Bank. And today, I'm glad to say that in a short period of two years, we have finished the negotiation on the 3rd of June, we signed the establishment agreement between APO and AfriExim. We have already gotten one of our member countries to sign and ratify the establishment agreement. We need one more to do that so that that treaty will become effective. Five countries are already working on this. They've gone very far in the ratification process. So the bank, in terms of establishment, we've gone there. The second is the decision on the headquarters. On the 4th of July, the Ministerial Council took a decision on the headquarters of the bank, citing it in Nigeria. Third is raising the funds. When we started this, many people said, are you sure that you guys can raise the funds? Do you believe that your countries have the commitment to this cause? I'm pleased to say that even before we had signed the establishment agreement by the two founding organizations, we were able to raise 45% of what we needed as a set of capital of the bank. And I want to thank Angola for being one of the countries that has paid part of its allocated shares. The other countries include Nigeria and Ghana and others. So this is where we are. Last week, I was in Cairo. We had a meeting with the president of Africa Exim Bank, and we have agreed on a date that we are going to launch the bank. This is something that I can't say here because this is something I'm taking to the ministerial council. Our ministerial council is going to meet on the 1st of, June, uh, of November, that's in about a month. And when they have endorsed the date, it will be announced publicly. But I want to make it clear that we have gone very far. We are, I think, the first development bank that has started from conceptualization to hopefully fruition in the shortest possible time, about two years plus. And I want to also say that even though Africa Energy Bank is going to be born or birthed in Nigeria, we will always remember that it was conceived in Luanda, Angola. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. You, you said you have 45%. I see Bill and Mike, they could top up and you could get to 100%. So you just make sure you have those discussions with, uh, with them. Mike, Mike writes checks. He doesn't do cash. So that's... Uh, Minister Diamantino, we are ending this uh, discussion. I would like to give you your final remarks, um, closing this ministerial discussion. But in your remarks, we'd also like to know what next for Angola. Thank you very much. Uh,
em Angola. Uh, in Angola, the last few years, tem, tem dito, uh, there's a saying uh, que devemos fazer that goes by that fazer. we should do and demonstrate uh, what we are doing. Dizem, Some say quando se mata uma cobra, that pau, when you kill a snake, you need to show the stick which you used, and obviously you need to show the snake so, itself. So there's no need of uh, beating around the bush without showing the facts. Uh, by what the Secretary of APO just told us, it is possible when we work together. It is possible to do good things for our continent. So I'd like to ask all of you to pay attention to this initiative of the African Energy Bank. All of us, including our partners, the non-African partners that are in Africa, which we also consider Africans, obviously, uh, please pay attention to these initiatives and also give your contribution. I believe that in the future, we will have an institution that, an institution to help our continent. I believe uh, it was, it was good for the summary from our sister from Namibia and we'll prepare ourselves to go visit Namibia. Uh, let me uh, emphasize that a human capital is very important and Angola in the oil and gas sector today, Angola has a human capital with vast experience and is available to support our sister countries, including uh, a profession of welders, etc., that Angola has uh, uh, plenty of with great um, experience and we also have institutions where all these professions are taught. We will disseminate uh, more potential that we have in human capital apart from what uh, we do. In the oil and gas sector, we have been working a lot and supporting our government for the creation of um, the different institutions, uh, teaching institutions from basic, uh, medium and uh, higher education. But I would like to call on to your attention to look at the report of the last five years on the social project for oil and gas. This report is available on the ministry's website so that everyone is aware of our contributions towards our country, not only with taxes and employment, rates or revenue, but also all other activities that we carry out in the economy uh, arena. We are building the research center of Sonangol, and we believe it is going to be an excellent center, and we also extend this to the biofuels, renewable energies, and to critical minerals for the energy transition. Lastly, and uh, once more, for the understanding of our society, uh, Sonango was guided to extend its core business to a renewable energies, for critical minerals, for the energy transition, for biofuels. Uh, I believe that the CEO of Sonango will talk, will give us more details on this, because we do not want to be distracted and see the train go by uh, at this uh, crucial moment of uh, our planet. We want to be at the forefront, and we have all the possibilities Abilities to do so together, all of us, all African countries and our partners, those that are with us in good faith, and I believe it's all of them that are represented here. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity for this opportunity. I believe that we'll continue discussions in detail. Our hydrocarbon sector and biofuels renewable energy as well, and 
everything with one and unique intention, which is to improve the livelihood of our people. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Minister. Um, before we close, I want to recognize one company that has really, really driven a lot of cross-border discussions, but a lot around training, development, capacity building of skills, but also making sure that the industry works very well. And certainly an Angolan that has really driven that and has been at the forefront on driving that. We can't discuss local content without ever thinking of a champion of it and driving excellence. Where's Miguel Batista? Can we please put our hands together for this great panel?